welcome everyone. I had left the topic of my art stop a little bit open um, because I had to decide soon after I got here what to talk about, but I decided to focus on this portrait of the Mughal Emperor Shah Jahan, um, which we've just put up a, a couple weeks ago here in this new rotation in these galleries. So the person we're looking at is an emperor of India who ruled between 1626 and 1656, just to give you an idea of what period of time we're in. And he ruled over a vast empire, most of northern and central India, expanding into Pakistan, Bangladesh. And if you've ever been to India and had a chance to see the Mughal monuments, you really understand that, oh my god, these were the most powerful and richest of all the dynasties. You compare what they built to what came before them. You look at the paintings created for them as opposed to other rulers. You really get a sense of their the you know, empire that they commanded. Um, and in looking at this painting, all of the, that is reinforced. We know right away that it's Shah Jahan because other portraits of him exist and he has a very recognizable face. But his um, role as emperor is emphasized by the artist in other ways. He's almost in the center of the painting, just a little off, um, and we see him with his favorite son, Dara Shuko, who is a tragic figure, really, in Mughal history. He was the favorite of Shah Jahan, and Shah Jahan hoped that he would succeed him, but he had a much more ambitious and ruthless brother who eventually did take over the throne and kill Dara Shuko soon after coming to power. Um, we also have this halo around Shah Jahan's head, emphasizing his, the exaltedness of his status. We have the very rich furnishings of this garden pavilion that they're in, marble platform and throne, a fancy carpet. He's under a, a woven textile that has uh, birds that are um, an imperial symbol, the phoenix above him, and he's wearing jeweled daggers, um, gold brocaded sash, he's got a long sword next to him on the platform. So all of this is emphasizing his role. And we see other elements of royal portraiture here in this room itself. We have you know, another very standard example of a ruler on horseback, like an imagery we can understand pretty easily is trying to convey this person's power and strength. Um, but portraiture on the whole is arise, well, came to arise during the Mughal period, um, and they had different modes of presenting the rulers. It was under Shah Jahan's grandfather, Akbar, where this whole genre really took off, and he decided to have portraits of all of the nobles in his empire painted. And so um, when people were summoned to court for different ceremonies, his artists would paint them, and those images were gathered into albums. Um, and those tended to be a single person against a blank background. We have an example here of that style. Um, but then the moguls after him continued to develop the genre, so we have images like this, as well as very interesting ones with allegorical paintings, especially for Shah Jahan's father, Jahangir, where we see him in these oops, totally made-up scenes. So we have him standing on top of a globe with his rival, the emperor of Iran, who is shown just a little bit smaller than him, again, a little bit off-center. Um, and they're standing above two animals, a calf and a lion, who are in harmony, sort of symbolizing the relations between these two dynasties, but actually they were you know, <laughs> very much in uh, combat over adjoining lands between the two empires. So we have this whole idea of portraiture really expanding at this time in the 17th century. And um, the artist who painted this particular painting, his name is Govardhan, worked at the um, Mughal court for several years, so he knew Shah Jahan very well, had been a part of developing his particular style of portraiture, knew him from when he was a young man, and then continued to work throughout his reign. 
And in Mughal portraiture, you have a few conventions that are always followed. The emperor is shown in strict sideways profile. He's never shown in any other way, no matter what his body is doing in a particular scene. And this is thought to convey you know, his particular rank as opposed to other people in a painting where you might see their full face or a three-quarter view of them. This is something specific to the emperor. Um, and what I like about this painting is we have a real connection to someone that actually held <laughs> and looked at this painting, Shah Jahan himself, who is probably considered, could be considered the most romantic husband in the world. He built the um, Taj Mahal, the tomb and memorial to his wife, who, whom he dearly loved and with whom he had a very good relationship, actually, which is unusual for the time. Um, so this was a painting that he owned, but he also wrote on it the name of the artist. So this is his own handwriting below the throne here saying the work of Govardhan. So that's how we know the artist, because the artists themselves didn't tend to sign these paintings. Um, uh, and then we also want to think about the context that this was displayed in. Um, it's something that would have been put into an album, so it's a book format. Um, and you have, would have had borders around it. The borders currently around it, which we aren't showing you, aren't original to the piece. It was something, um, a piece of paper that this was placed into later, but the painting next to it here gives you a sense of what that would have been. You have wide borders around three sides of the painting, and then the inside, which would have been you know, the binding of the book, is a little bit narrower because you have to imagine two uh, pages open to each other, so that narrow border, um, once you add the two of them together on the inside of the book, gives you the proportions of the outer borders as well. And typically in Mughal albums, you would have alternated um, openings with two paintings facing each other with two openings of calligraphy. So on the back of this painting is this particular sample of calligraphy. Um, and you can see a bit of the later borders that the page was inserted into. And while we today don't pay as, tend to pay as much attention to the calligraphy, you see that um, Edwin Binney had typed some notes here, pasted them onto the bottom of this page. Obviously, this wasn't the side of the paper that he was interested in collecting. To um, the Mughal emperors, the calligraphy was just as prized, and so they collected samples of work by famous calligraphers. They would um, add the um, illumination, the word just went out of my head for a moment there, around it, and then, as I said, alternate it in, the, um, in their albums with portraits or other types of painted images. And so now that we've had a chance to get into Mughal portraiture, I think it's interesting to go back upstairs and compare to sort of the symbols and conventions of European paintings at the time, because while there are some um, similarities in there, there are a lot of differences that the Indian artists really seized on. Thanks. <laughs>